All right. Well, with an increased number of economists saying the U.S. is headed back into recession, consumer confidence plunging to the lowest level in more than two years, and new jobs numbers due out Friday expected to disappoint, the president took to the podium to talk jobs and investment. He's pushing to extend some bills set to expire next month. Here's why. That's what we're going to need to do in the short term. Keep people on the job, keep vital projects moving forward, fund projects that are already underway in a smarter way. Uh, of course, if we're honest, we also know that when it comes to our nation's infrastructure, our roads, our railways, mass transit, airports, uh, we shouldn't just be playing uh, patch up or catch up. Uh, we should be leading the world. Well, you can give a speech all you want, but in reality, President Obama and Congress have failed to deliver so far with two years of around 9% unemployment. And likely the bigger deal next month we want to point to, what we could see, we're hearing more and more about it, is that the Fed may be the one to act with another round of quantitative easing, what some people like to call money printing. The Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, well, an official there said the Fed should consider it. On Wall Street, they're calling for it. J.P. Morgan says they think it's coming in September. Goldman Sachs thinks it's coming too. And Federal Reserve minutes show they came just this close in August to doing it. But just who does this help? We know that quantitative easing has helped Wall Street because it boosts equity markets and creates a demand for treasuries, which are already on banks' books. And it's also helped the federal government because it allows them to borrow at an extremely low price because it pushes down the yields on treasuries when it buys them up. But what would this do for millions of jobless Americans, afraid or too broke to spend, underwater on their mortgages, or for small businesses, which Ben Bernanke say still can't get loans? Here to help us answer that is Peter Schiff. President of Euro Pacific Capital. Thanks so much for being here, Peter. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Laura. Now, we know that quantitative easing in the past has helped Wall Street, it's helped Washington, but how has it helped everyone else, average folks who are broke and don't have jobs? Well, it hasn't. I mean, the reason that we're headed back into recession is because the Fed did QE2. You know, money printing is not the solution to our problems. It's the source of our problems. You know, I was on record before any of these uh, Wall Street economists in, in saying that QE3 was a certainty. I knew it was coming because I knew that QE2 didn't work. And I knew that rather than learning from its mistakes, the Fed would re repeat them. So then who would another round of QE help? Because we're hearing Wall Street banks call for it. Well, you know, you mentioned it earlier. It helps the government get bigger. It helps the government keep borrowing and spending. But that doesn't help the economy. The government is too big. It's spending too much. The fact that the Fed is making it easier for the government to go deeper into debt is counterproductive. If we had higher interest rates, then it might force some responsibility on our leaders. So certainly the government will gain at the economy's expense. Wall Street will gain. Cheap money will continue to flow, uh, so the Wall Street bonuses will continue to come. But real credit will continue to be scarce on Main Street. You're not going to have any real uh, capital investment until we have real credit coming from savings. We actually need higher interest rates. That's part of the solution. But unfortunately, the Fed doesn't want that. I mean, and Ben Bernanke actually thinks QE2 worked, but it didn't work unless, you know, maybe. Uh, a heroin addict thinks that shooting up with some more heroin works and that it delays the withdrawal. Uh, but, you know, spending borrowed money feels good, but it doesn't produce economic growth. It actually helps us dig ourselves into a deeper ditch. Or if Ben Bernanke thinks that maybe it's helping because it's helping Wall Street. I just want to point out just one example of how this benefits Wall Street besides what we talked about. Make sure I'm clear on this. If I'm Goldman Sachs and I know that the government is going to do more QE, can't I go out and buy up treasuries and then sell them back to the Federal Reserve and make money on the deal? Well, Wall Street, certainly some of the banks that are trading in the Treasury markets are flipping them, buying them and selling them to the Treasury. But Wall Street makes a lot more money based on the fact that interest rates are being held artificially low. It helps to finance all their leveraged transactions. You're talking about highly leveraged entities on, on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's good for Wall Street is not good for America. You know, mm -hmm. part of the solution to America's problems is a contraction on Wall Street. We have too large a percentage of our GMP in finance. Mm -hmm. That has to shrink. That sec sector has to contract. But the government keeps propping it up with cheap money. 
But in order to prop up finance, the government has to drain the money uh, from other areas of the economy where it's badly needed. We well, need to produce more things. We need to make more stuff. And we're not going to do that if all the credit that would finance business is financing speculation instead. Yeah, and if the, if the Fed really wanted Wall Street banks to lend, why would they be incentivizing them not to lend by paying them interest on reserves? Well, you know, what we really need, remember, is there has to be savings to be loaned out. You know, you have to look at it from the perspective of the saver. No one is going to save when interest rates are practically zero. Mm -hmm. So there is no real credit. All that happens is the Federal Reserve prints a bunch of money, and what they do is the banks take it and loan it to the government uh, mm -hmm. to spend because the government is borrowing over $1.5 trillion a year. And what they don't loan to the government by buying treasuries, they speculate in oil or other commodities or the stock market. But none of this speculative activity is, is leading to increased production uh, to a growing U.S. economy. There is no real credit available uh, for real business because mm -hmm. nobody wants to take a risk and loan to a business when they can loan risk-free uh, to the government. Well, loan, and also I just want to pull up this chart to show how the reserves at the Fed have increased. You've seen banks... I mean, it's a blue line, Peter, that I don't know if you can see it. It's flat, and then it just goes straight up because banks are now keeping a trillion or more dollars there, a thousand times more than what they were before the crisis. Yeah, and what they're doing, though, is they're monetizing uh, the, the deficits through the banks because that money is not just sitting there. It's in treasuries. Mm -hmm. it, it, and that means the government is spending the money uh, to, to run the government. But do you think that it's possible that the reason we haven't seen the type of runaway hyperinflation that you've been talking about for years is because a lot of the extra money that the Fed is Fed has printed is sitting on bank balance sheets and not being lent out. Well, I'm talking about hyperinflation happening eventually, not right now. And of course, mm -hmm. that's a worst case scenario. I think what's really stopping hyperinflation is foreign central banks continuing to support the U.S. dollar. But when countries like China, like Japan, uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, all the countries that are hoarding dollars mm -hmm. uh, come to the realization that this is a waste of money, that they're undermining their own economies, they're, they're importing our inflation uh, by tying their currencies to the dollar, once the dollar really loses that reserve currency status and foreign central banks no longer support it, that's when I think hyperinflation will really take hold. Unless, of course, the government, the Federal Reserve, does a complete about face, dramatically increases interest rates, and allows the economy to restructure, including the U.S. government to restructure its debt. Because mm -hmm. if interest rates rise to a market level, there is no way the U.S. government can pay the interest, let alone the principal, on the amount that it's borrowed. Right, and it takes away from everything else that it spends money on right now. But I'm wondering if you think that we're getting to that point, maybe, with China. If you see this as a sign, China has announced that they're giving a break on income tax to most of the people in the population, aside from just very rich ones. 60 million won't pay it at all. They're doing it to try to boost spending. Do you think that's yeah, a I sign? Think, you know, China, I, I think behind the scenes, they understand the problem, but they're still reluctant to admit it. Uh, it's hard to admit that you've made a mistake. And in order for China to do the right thing now, they have to acknowledge that for years they've, they've done the wrong thing. Uh, so I guess that's difficult to do. But ultimately, they're going to have to do it because the cost of continuing to repeat these mistakes is, is enormous. And, you know, obviously the Chinese are trying to buy more gold and diversify their reserves into other currencies. But they continue to accumulate dollars in treasuries and they continue to create inflation in their own country and, and looking for other ways to deal with the symptoms rather than getting down to the root cause of the disease. Do you think, though, that if they stimulate spending in their own country, will that mean anything for average middle class people in the United States? Well, sure. If the Chinese allow the RMB, their currency, to go up in value, then Chinese people will automatically buy more stuff because stuff will be cheaper for them. Mm -hmm. And as the price of things comes down, more people will buy. And so if the Chinese buy more of what they produce, then they're going to have a lot less left over to export to us. So Americans are going to see much higher prices for the things we buy because the Chinese are buying them instead. And we'll just have to buy what, what's left over. And, of course, if there's a smaller supply, there's going to be higher prices. And that is what America has in its future, much, much uh, higher prices and a reduced supply of consumer goods. And China, in its future, has lower prices and more abundant consumer goods. It all depends on when the government 
throws the switch. And, and you know, it's something that Americans already can't afford to pay for a lot of things. Walmart just recently said that now food has become the biggest concern uh, affecting their customers, the prices. But I'll tell you who can afford pretty much anything they want, CEOs. A new study today shows that the top 25 companies in the U.S., and there's a list of their logos there, paid more to their CEOs in 2010 than they did to the federal government in taxes. Peter, how are CEOs being paid so much more at a time when the economy is so bad in the U.S.? Well, yeah, I, I guess I'd rather the CEOs have it than the government, but clearly, uh, you know, there is a big disparity in the United States between the CEO pay and the pay of rank and file workers that, that doesn't exist uh, in a lot of other countries to that extent. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, with, with, with the corporate culture that we've had of, uh, you know, where companies are not paying much in the way of dividends and, and, and instead all of the, uh, the profits are, are, are held off to, uh, uh, to executives. And I think ultimately that would change in an environment of, of, of tighter money. If, if we had a, a more responsible Fed with higher interest rates and so that stocks had to compete with higher yielding bonds, I think that might force companies to pay much higher dividends which means they wouldn't have as much money left over to shower on their executives. They'd actually have to give some of it to the shareholders uh, in the form of higher dividends. So once again, Peter, what I just heard you say is the Fed is in part to blame. Something to think about as we're going into what many people see and what you predicted will be another round of quantitative That's, easing. You know, they've turned Wall Street into a casino. You know, everybody just buys stocks betting on the comp. You know, they're not buying them for the income, but they're hoping they appreciate. And that whole speculative mentality has been fostered by this environment of cheap money. And rather than putting an end to the party, you know, what does Ben Bernanke want to do? He wants to put more, uh, you know, spike in the punch uh, so that we don't sober up. A vicious cycle. Thanks so much, Peter Schiff, president of Euro-Pacific Capital, for telling us what you think.